big welcome. It's our community, and I'm delighted to see that you've come back to visit us. We have a particularly interesting, we have two guests today. Normally, you know, we just have one, but today we're, we've got two first. <laughs> and they are very interesting because one is a papa and one is a son. And the son we are particularly proud of because he is part of our family at Johnson County Community College. His father, because he's older and we <laughs> must defer, is Joseph Horvat. And the son is Chris Horvat. And they are going to talk to us about a most interesting historical um, monument, I think, to God in uh, Kansas City, Kansas on Strawberry Hill. And that's St. John the Baptist Church. It's a Croatian church. And the parish was established by immigrants living on Strawberry Hill. And I, I need to say this real quick. If you haven't been to the Strawberry Hill Museum, it's right there by the church, not too far, about a block away, isn't it? If you, you must go, because the Strawberry Hill Museum contains the history of the immigrants, the Croatians mostly, but immigrants from Eastern Europe who came to this country. So I, I would urge you to go and see it. But uh, St. John the Baptist was blessed on May the 15th, 1904, and every pastor has been Croatian speaking. Are they hard to find? Well, they were. You know, the, our last, our current pastor is uh, of uh, Latino descent. Really? So that's the first one that wasn't uh, either named Horvat or Croatian. <laughs> <laughs> I, to I told the Horvats, I said, you know, th uh, the family has given more than its share uh, to the church in the in the form of priests and nuns. There was a Monsignor too, wasn't there? Monsignor Horvat, and then Father Frank Horvat was our our pastor for a long time. Those are just the most recent. Yeah. But historically, the Horvats have been very generous well, with the church. Uh, only since 1904. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the point is that St. John the Baptist Church has been extremely instrumental in keeping the Croatian culture alive in, in our area. Don't you think so, Chris? Absolutely, yeah. There's, there's so much culture and history there, and I think the museum is a big part of that, too, just keeping that alive. Well, I think it's only fair that we take a look um, at least, well, I guess it's four generations, three generations, four, four generations of the Horvat family as we talk about St. John the Baptist Church. And we have to start with Anton. Anton Horvat was your grandfather. My grandfather, yes. Joseph's grandfather. See, right. this is really a genealogy <laughs> lesson here, right? And uh, uh, talk about Anton just a little bit. Well, uh, briefly, Anton came to immigrate to this country, to the United States, in 1908. He was 17 years old, and uh, he immigrated there to work in the packing house. At that time, and that's a lot of what the Eastern European folks that came to this Kansas City, Kansas, came to do. Right, to work yeah. in the packing yes. houses, because well, there's several reasons. Uh, because it was you know dirty work working in the slaughterhouse was very uncomfortable work. And at that time there was some labor uh, strife in Kansas City, Kansas, so the Armors uh, Company, Armors Packing Company, they started recruiting. And they didn't, you know, you didn't go to, you don't go to France or Germany to recruit. You go where people were used to working with animals, uh, sheep and, and cows and stuff yeah. like that, of course. And so that's why he was recruited to come here so the first time he was ever on a train was when he got on the train to go to the boat in La Havre, France, to sail over to the United States. And he was 17. He was 17. He got off the boat in, uh, at Ellis Island and um, um, put on a train and ended up at St. John's at uh, Strawberry Hill. <laughs> well, that was a long trip for a 17-year-old kid. Yeah. But he has left behind him a very long legacy. Yeah. And we have to look at this family. Now, Chris, who, who are these people? Well, you've got uh, my, my grandfather and great-grandfather, and they're all standing in front of the, the altar, one of the altars that my great-grandfather made. And, uh, he carved out of wood, out of scrap wood, whatever things he could find. And just uh, some of the, my great aunts and uh, 
to the other family. Uh, that's just one of the, the pictures they took. Uh, when he was done with it, they were very proud of it, obviously, gathered all the family around. But you know what, what is really, I think, a beautiful thing is the commitment of the Horvat family to the church and to God. And it has come down through the whole family. And I'm sure that behind Anton was the same kind of commitment to the church. Oh, yes. But yeah. he was the first American. <laughs> and uh, he, he made his mark. Yep. I, I also think it's important to talk about the immigrants of, that came to this country about that same time. And your father served in World War II. Right. And was wounded. Yep. You said he had a foot blown off? Uh, it, he ankle had a, injury. His ankle, uh, he was in the South Pacific, and a Japanese uh, bullet had pierced his left ankle, blew out his left ankle bone completely. <clears throat> but I think the point that we really have to make here is that these people that came to this country came for a better life, they came to earn a good living for their families, and they wanted to be Americans. Right. And so they served uh, the country that they had adopted that became their country. And I, I love this picture of these two little boys <laughs> standing in front of this altar. And who are those two little boys who are not little boys yeah, anymore? Yeah, not anymore. Um, <laughs> That's my dad and, and his uh, younger brother, Jim. Now, the older one is you. Yes. Yeah. And the youngest, the little one is Uncle Jim. Yep. Yeah, my brother. And that was a, a picture that the Kansas City Star took back in, what year was that? It's in the 50s. 1952. See, now you've told your age. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think, isn't that wonderful to have all of this wonderful history of this, of this family? And I... Um, I, I, I really, well, I want to talk about, I, I want to talk about the talent, the next thing that, that comes into the Horvat family. And Chris, Chris is an artist, his father is an artist, and your, was your father an artist? Well, he, he probably would have been if he hadn't been wounded, but yeah. he, uh, because he was wounded, he was, then went to, he was, his mastership was in uh, upholstery, oh, uh -huh. building fine furniture. But see, there again, that art comes out because great grandpa was definitely an artist. But oh, I yeah. wanna, I want you to see uh, two pictures, and they were done, one by Joseph, the father, and one by Chris, the son, mm -hmm. when they were just about the same age, and it is apparent that both of them liked football. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but but I I just think these are really good. Thank you. I, you never made any money doing this, did you? No, no. But you do. Yeah, yeah. I still do. Um, my main job is here at the college, uh, uh -huh. video and that kind of stuff. I've always liked film but, and also uh, painting and drawing. So there's always kind of an attempt to try to do a little bit of both. Um, and this is some of my, my college work here. The, the one on the left is the Lynn Dawson. Uh, I did that one in, in college when I was about the same age as the one on the right, which is Ed Podolak, which Dad did back in the 70s. So. Okay. And Both then big you, Chiefs fans. Well, but you do portraits now, mm -hmm. you told me, mostly. Mostly commissioned uh, portraits. Yeah. Uh, but you of. have done other things. Mm -hmm. I know you did a really large, very contemporary piece. Right, the still life. Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, that was an assignment yeah. back in the college days just to go out and find what they call uh, found objects. Uh -huh. And um, I've always liked the Coca-Cola brand and the logos and those things, so I thought I'd incorporate some of that into it. And it's just bunch of stuff I found and put out and then uh, painted on a large scale. That's probably the largest painting I've ever done. That's it's, a big one. Yeah, it's a big one. It takes <laughs> up a whole wall. Too. But you know, talking about found objects, that must run in the family too. Because Absolutely. Anton used found objects. And, and I think we need to take a, a look at this beautiful. Now, Anton did not do the figures on the altar. He did right. just the, the base. base. Yeah. And he used found objects. Absolutely, and Dad knows more about it than I do. Talk, ab talk about that just a little bit. Uh, he, yeah, it would bore you to tears to, <laughs> to learn what he did, and many of the things we're just finding as we re as my brother restored the altars, uh, Quaker oat boxes. He would cut those because they were round, you know, perfectly round. He would cut those down and then put lights in them. Uh, bottle caps. Uh, what else did he use? Washers. Washers. Yeah. For anything that was round, that had to be consistent, he would use washers. Uh, just any, and the, all the wood was whatever he found. Well, 
And it's, it, you know, if you look at the detail of the altar, you can see the, the washers right. along there, which yeah. I, I, you know, isn't that wonderful? Because you know what? His, his thought was the church is for the people. Yeah. And so found objects are the people's objects. Yeah. I just think it's, it's a lovely, lovely thought. You know, when I looked up close at the, at the detail of the altar, I noticed that it had coat after coat after coat of paint on it. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> I mean, it it's, was good then and it's good now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and those are the oldest one. I think it's about 100 years old, isn't it? Yeah. The large one, the larger one is yeah. about 100 years. How long did it take him to do this? Well, he would, he, uh, he would just work in his spare time, uh, you know, with a pocket knife and sandpaper and just whatever he had time, an hour a night, but all his life, that was his hobby. Well, and you know, we'll come back to the church in just a minute, but I wanted you to know that he did other things as well. Um, it's a, let me turn this so you can see. It's a pipe. Did he use it? Or just, or was it just a... Did I think it's been it? used, yeah. It's been <laughs> well, it's absolutely beautiful, and I, and I think you need to notice that there are metal inlays in that pipe. I mean, that's not easy to do. That's, yeah. that's tough stuff. And then the flute that he, did he play the flute? I don't, you know, we don't know. But, but you know, that's not easy. Uh, and he somehow, he had to hollow out that flute. Yeah. You know, it's um, Just used a carving knife as, as far yeah. as we know. But it's kind of interesting. He um, put his initials, T-H, why T instead of A? Well, the, the uh, the Croatians at that time were really sensitive about becoming Americanized. So Anton was an unusual name for an American, so he always wanted to go by Tony. <laughs> That's where the T came from. <laughs> he wanted to Americanize his name. You know, um, again, it just shows that when they, they wanted to learn the language, they wanted to work, they wanted to be Americans. And I, I just, do you speak Croatian? I do, yes. Do you, Chris? Da, da. Govorim, govorim Hrvatski. Malo, malo. Malo, malo. A little malo. Oh, he's not going to let you have <laughs> Did you speak Croatian at home? How did, how did you learn? That's a, the question. I really. picked up a lot from him, and then we took uh, lessons at one point. Oh, did you? Well, you know, that's interesting. When I was growing up, when I was a young man and stuff, how did you know you were speaking Croatian? <laughs> You know, if somebody said bread, all we knew is get some bread. You know, I didn't know it was kru or bread because when you're young, you don't, right. you know, you don't translate. You just, uh, whatever somebody wants, that's what you get. But, you know, it's interesting. The way we're really learning a lot of Croatian now is from another student here at Johnson County, Mario Funcic. He's on the golf team, and he's from Pula in Croatia. Uh -huh. And he, boy, he's an excellent golfer, but we uh, uh, we entertain him, or better, he entertains us, mm -hmm. and we, we speak Croatian to each other a lot, and that's where you really learn the idioms and the, the phrases and stuff, you know. Yeah, well, there are a lot of chiches in Croatia. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our name actually means Croatian, the last name. Does it really? Yeah. yeah. Well, often last names denote where they came from, too. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, it absolutely does with us. Definitely. Horvat in, in the Croatian the, language. The city, I mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Horvat in the Croatian language is Hrvat, H-R-V-A-T. And our name, of course, is Horvat, which means a man from Croatia. Well, and see, you just made it easier to pronounce right. when they <laughs> what spelled it. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of times when immigrants came through Ellis Island, they didn't understand the the um, the uh, immigration authorities that checked them in didn't understand what they said. So lots of times their name really wasn't what it was when they started yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, they just kind of gave them what they heard. Like yeah. the Corleone family. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. D tell me, uh, did did you know your grandfather? Yes. I was uh, uh, about seven years old before he died. Do you remember any stories he told you or anything? Well, yes, I do, oddly enough. Uh, Please. Well, one of them was, uh, I remember him, I was tr just learning how to talk and, you know, say things, but 
I remember asking him if we were rich. Uh -huh. we, were we, are we rich? And he, he reached in his pocket and pulled out some coins and rubbed those and he says, yes, we are rich. And then he said, in Stadi Krai, in the old country, if a person had this money, he was rich. Because in the old country, they just, they dealt on the barter system. You know, two sheep for this uh, fabric or something like that. So he, that he had actual coins in his hand, that meant money. That meant money. That, so he was rich. And tell me what he did in, in the packing house. What did he do down there? Well, he had several jobs. He started off as a scaler. A scaler it pulled skin off of hogs, skinned them. That was called the scaler. And then he, he made butter. He worked uh, he worked to the day he died. He in fact he died at Armour's Packing House on the front front stoops. You know, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking to myself, we don't know what it is to work really hard. <laughs> he worked hard. Mary, let me tell you another quick little story. Oh please. Uh the house that he lived in. Uh he kept Oh, great notes, wrote down everything. Really? And in he, English or Croatian? In Croatian. Mm -hmm. He wrote down about when the house was delivered to the street where he lived, which is on Strawberry Hill. It said, Danas, today the house arrived. It was from Sears. It was a Sears kit. But he, he makes a note about having to hire two more mules to pull the wagon with the house in it. That was in 1914, and then... Uh, that was the year the First World War started. Right. Uh, and later in those notes, he writes about uh, Danas today, uh, the angels came and took my son. He had a son named Anthony, who was uh, nine years old when he died of pneumonia. And that's the way he wrote it. It was just beautiful language. Um, but the other thing I was going to tell you, the little anecdote is about the language. We would talk Croatian around there. Or, or, like I said, we didn't know what we were talking. But, we, we just conversed. <laughs> but yes. if I would talk in Croatian, he would always say, no, no, talk, you're in English, or you're in America, talk English. Right. You know, did, made a point on it. But then he and his mother would talk Croatian. And my father wrote several letters uh, to uh, him when he was in the service in Croatian, which yeah, was, yeah. you know, really interesting. Oh, yeah. We just found know, one recently. You should write that up, get, get him to translate, because obviously you're not as good at speaking Croatian as your father. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we trade words here and there. <laughs> but really, <laughs> you, know you should translate that, that diary that he kept. Because I, you know, um, if for nothing else, the Strawberry Hill Museum would be able to perpetuate um, the culture even more with with uh, that diary. I, I I think that would just be a and wonderful thing. You know, we, we recently obtained a letter written in Croatian that my father had written when he was on uh, the South Pacific. And uh, uh, it hadn't been seen for 70 years. And so we got that from one of my aunts and we took it to Mario to translate, and he had a hell of a time. And he just, you know, he's, he's from Croatia, of course. Uh -huh. He Why? had a hell of a time translating Why? it. Because the language was written in language that a person used at the turn of the century. The Croatian that his son, my father, learned was that Croatian. And, you know, they didn't read or write English in those days. I mean, he lived on a, on a farm. Mm -hmm. um, so the the language is that kind of language, that kind of Croatian. That's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we found it was interesting when we translated that letter. Yeah. Because Mario was having a having a heck of a time with some of the words in there. Yeah, some of the, the, the modern uh, terminology is so different. Is it important to you, Chris, to perpetuate the Croatian culture? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Why do you think that is? Because most, I have to tell you, that most young people your age, they don't care about the culture of their ancestors. Yeah, it's so deeply ingrained in our family. Uh, we still have a lot of, they, on, the, on the hill, they still have a lot of cultural events, music, and festivals and things. Well, at the Strawberry Hill Museum, they do. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. 
and it's just I, I always try to participate in that and, and hear some of the music and that culture because it's it's been passed down the you know the, the lyrics and, and some of these things that they're singing today are, are you know songs that are maybe a hundred years old or older uh, and those things were all passed down it, it's um, it's not unusual for each of the families to have their own kind of traditions and things that the, the Croatians brought over you know like my great-grandfather did more than a hundred years ago and it's been passed down to whether it's art you know that runs through our family or uh, one of my aunts makes the Croatian Povetica, which is the Croatian oh, nut bread. I know what it is. It makes okay. me fatter and fatter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's one of those things. It's just the recipe was passed down. Yeah. You know, that's another kind of art form in itself. It is. No, and it is. Um, you know, the that's been passed down just from generation to generation. And the, the the neat thing about the we had all these these works in the show and exhibit down there at the museum for a few months and to see each generation, I think it's five generations actually all all told. And they each had something different, a different media and different way to, to express themselves. It was the, the altars and nativity scenes that my great-grandfather did, and my grandfather did the upholstery and that kind of stuff. Worked for TWA for a while doing that. And then, um, you know, painting, drawing, his drawings and paintings, and mine as well. But, you know, the truth is that your whole life is tied up in this neighborhood and in this church. Yeah. What is the um, size of the church? Larger, smaller, same? What What is the the? Um, well, it's the same as it was when it was built. And no, no, the, the parish, the oh. congregation. Uh, well, I used to know that. Mm -hmm. I well, has it gotten smaller? Yeah. Oh I yeah, think years, yeah, yeah. Because well, the main thing was that when the turnpike came in down there, it it wiped out three fourths of the hill. It did. And it did. all those little small houses that were down there. They were taken by the turnpike. Well, it kind of cut it in two. There's some on the other side of the highway too, aren't there? Some left, a few over there. When you look on the east side, yeah, no, nothing left. No, no, turnpike took all that. So all that's left is the the rest of it, the between Minnesota Avenue and Central, and you know it's kind of it's got its firm boundaries. Yeah, if but a lot of the far, old people are moving off of Strawberry Hill. Yeah, the, the old ones are dying. Yeah, and the you don't live in Strawberry Hill. No. No, no. See? No. Is, is the house still there? The, 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 the Sears house? <laughs> yes. It's still there. My aunt still lives in it. You know, it, it's seen better days, yeah. but... So have we all, Joe. <laughs> 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 but, you know, oddly enough, uh, or maybe perhaps not so odd, is that there are several... Because you have a friend who moved back from right. Strawberry Hill, yeah. Sachin. Somewhere and uh, his sister so there's some families that and the Soptics they moved back down there yeah some people have kind of repopulated who had moved away see maybe you back. can buy your aunt's house and mm -hmm. move back Chris. Nice place to live. <laughs> they're small houses they're they're so close you could yeah, I think they people are. they are he used to talk about people yeah. you know knocking on the door just yelling out to the window just borrow a cup of flour they ever knew each other and a lot of them were related yeah oh so, yeah but but I don't know in some ways I think it's kind of sad that we're losing that yeah life well that's, that's important assimilation is good and bad yeah. the life on strawberry hill and my brother and i have talked about this many times but we grew up in the 50s on strawberry hill it was one church you you know you knew where you were going to go you knew you where you're going to serve mass and and all that stuff the religious stuff and uh, you spoke the same language you ate the same food you listened to the same music it was just very comfortable, very well, nice, you know. Well, Kansas City, Kansas is kind of an interesting place because everybody has their own church. The Slovenians have mm -hmm. their church, the Croatians have their church, somebody else. And then there's the others who go to the Episcopal Church. <laughs> you know, it's really very interesting. Yeah. I, but, yeah. it, you know, the times they are changing, and I guess um, we change with them. Is there anything else? Oh, I know. You know, when, when Anton carved the altar. This is another thing I want to add. How did he decide what shape it would take? In other words, somebody must have, I know that there are certain uh, figures on that altar. Was he told that they were to go there? Or how did he, how did he do that? Or did they have the figures? Where did the figures come from? Well, it, mo most of the figures came from Italy, which at the turn of the century and for a long time, that was the place to go for statuary uh, stuff, so he would he would either obtain them 
or more than likely he had somebody buy them for him, you know, buy the statuary. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff up there. Oh, yeah. Because we're talking about the sacrifice of Abraham. There's something up there about that. And then we have the Alpha and the Omega with all the, um, I don't know how many angels, but there are an awful lot of angels up there. And then we have, of course, the crown and all that. So that they must have maybe ordered the statues and then made the altar to to uh, fit. I, you know, I just think it's so interesting. Well, it, yes, all that, all that stuff at the time the church, St. John the Baptist, was uh, founded, all the work in there was done. The, the murals there, the, the apostles on the walls, mm -hmm. those were all done by an Italian mural painter. The altar itself was built by a Croatian guy. Um, I don't sure who knows what his name is yeah. now, but the original. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think too that um, the last thing I just want to take a minute or two and talk about the um, Cretius that he made, the the uh, you know the major scenes. Yeah. He carved those too, and you have. Well, where are they? Do you have those, or are they at the Strawberry Hill Museum? Where are they? Well, I I just donated one to the museum. To the museum. Um, so if I visit the museum, I can see yeah. Anton's creation. Okay. Yeah, there were several that were, you know, for the show, for the exhibit, we brought all these together. And uh -huh. they'd never been under one roof. And it was kind of neat to see all that, you know, 100 years, five generations of this work all together. And you can just see the detail that he put into it. And it's really amazing, you know, to see all that work. Well, and I, you know, I, I it always comes to mind of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. <laughs> And I think Anton was one of those people. And I, 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 I know that there, the original bell is also in that church. And I think that you might be interested in what that bell says. And as I thank Joseph Horvat and Chris Horvat and the whole Horvat family, <laughs> I would tell you that the bell is inscribed, the living I summon, the dead I mourn, and the thunder I disperse. <laughs> and it's on the bell at St. John the Baptist Croatian Church in Kansas City, Kansas. We're all neighbors. And isn't it interesting to meet the neighbors in our community? Thank you so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure to see you, and it's such a pleasure to have both of you. Thank you. You're very welcome.